Hello, everyone. On behalf of the YWCA Edmonton staff and board of directors, I want to warmly welcome you to the Power Lunch Speaker Series featuring Casey Matron from Parity YEG. My name is Hila Mohammed, and I'm the volunteer coordinator for Parity YEG. Before we begin, I want to respectfully acknowledge. Uh, I want to uh, respectfully acknowledge that the YWCA Edmonton is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoda Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many other and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. The YWC Edmonton has been proudly serving and empowering women and families in the Edmonton area for 113 years. Through world wars, the Spanish flu, and many other trying times, they've been there with a the helping hand. So COVID-19 has been no different. The YWCA is hard at work helping vulnerable women and families in our communities get through this crisis and ensuring an important woman's voice and perspective is at every decision making table during this time. The Power Lunch is also part of their COVID-19 response plan. While we might not be able to gather in person, it's important now more than ever to come together and host powerful conversations that spotlight Canadian women doing incredible things that make our world a better place. The Virtual Power Lunch Speaker Series featured five Canadian women we think you should know and celebrate, including award-winning authors, diplomats, and women rights activists. Today, we welcome Casey Matron to the Power Lunch. Casey is a co-founder and the chair of Parity YEG, a nonprofit working towards gender parity in politics and public office. Casey will be making a presentation today titled The Road to the Municipal Election and Gender Parity. It will be followed by a Q&A session that we hope you participate in. We are also joined by two moderators, the YWCA Edmonton board members Sandra Mochiska and Lisa Holm. Sandra is the Executive Director at the Council of Canadians of African and Caribbean Heritage. In 2018, she co-founded a children's book publishing company called A Silly Kid, which produces and distributes books with characters of African heritage. Lisa is the, co Lisa is the founder and partner, um, Sorry, uh, Lisa is the founding partner and chief operating officer at Diplomat Consulting. She has, she has held several public service roles, including being a former counselor and mayor of Mournville and president of the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. So, uh, so with that, please grab your lunch and be, and be prepared to be inspired. Uh, Sandra and Lisa, over to you. Well, thank you very much and welcome to everyone. We're so excited to have you with us today on behalf of the YW board. Um, I just want to welcome everyone and tell you how um, really excited we are to have this conversation and talking about how to get more women involved in local government, a cause that's very close to my heart. So the first thing I wanted to do before I introduce our speaker is just um, let you know a little bit about how the timing of today will work. If you've been to one of our lunches in the past, you obviously know that we'll have a presentation for uh, approximately 20 minutes or so, uh, then followed by a Q&A session that will be about 25 minutes and then wrap up. So we'll have the opportunity to be able to ask Casey a lot of great questions um, regarding her presentation or any other topics that come to mind. As well, I wanted to give a bit of a shout out. We are talking about elected officials and getting more women involved in politics. And uh, one thing that I always think is really important is that we do talk a lot about getting women involved, but we should also be talking about supporting the women that are already there. So if you are a female elected official in any capacity, please let us know in the chat. Just put us a note saying your name and which position you hold so that we are able to recognize you. During the Q&A portion, uh, there is a button as part of Zoom that you can click on. Um, you can then see the, the Q&A. You're able to put questions in through that portal as well as see questions that others have submitted. 
Um, there is a ranking, so you're able to click on the questions that you relate to the most, that you'd like to see answered, and vote them up. And we'll be able to choose the, the questions that way based on what the popular support is. So just to get things started, I want to make as much time as possible for Casey to be able to talk. I, I'm really, really honored to be able to introduce our speaker today. So Casey Machen is the co-founder and chair of Parity Egg, like we've heard. And Parity Egg, we will learn a lot about, but essentially it's this incredibly bold grassroots organization that really aims to change the culture by empowering women to take more leadership roles throughout public service. Prior to that role, Casey was the um, vice chair of Equal Voice Alberta North, which was the organization that was put into place that is, is still active throughout Alberta, but um, really the, uh, the Parity Egg has taken the place of that. Um, she also has sat on numerous boards and committees throughout Edmonton and the region, um, and that includes things that are extremely important and close to the YW's heart, like the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton and RISE, the Reconciliation and Solidarity Edmonton Committee. Um, Casey also, she puts that 20 years of volunteer experience uh, and her love of community building to action in her day job. active volunteer and just so many other things. Uh, Casey is very inspirational. She has inspired me personally by the way that she is always there standing up and really fighting for women to have a seat at the table, to feel empowered and for young women especially to feel like they can see themselves have a role to play in local politics. So Casey, very excited to hear your presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Oh my goodness, I totally do not deserve uh, that kind of recognition, but thank you very much nonetheless. Um, I guess we can sort of just jump right in, I'm assuming. Yeah, please go ahead. Perfect. Uh, so we've got um, a bit of a presentation for you today. So I think that that will get put up on the screen. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, so like I said, uh, or like uh, Hebo had mentioned and Lisa, uh, my name is Casey and I am the chair um, and founder, co-founder of Parity YG. Um, in my everyday life, I am a policy and communications advisor for a current city councillor at City of Edmonton. Um, and yes, I have over 15 years of experience working in um, politics on campaigns to elected office in all levels of government. So um, yeah, Parity YG, again, it's a grassroots multipartisan organization. Our sole mission is to increase gender parity in all levels of public office. And we currently um, have members from all political leanings and pride ourselves on working together um, to address the lack of gender equity in public office. So we'll flip to slide two. Perfect. Perfect. So today's discussion. Um, today, we are going to cover uh, quite a bit. I, uh, I'm assuming that most of you that are tuning in today probably know far more about this than I do, but uh, I'll just cover a few of the um, basics of the history of women's representation, uh, reasons for lack of women and gender minorities in office, uh, why gender parity is important, and what we can all do about it. Uh, on to the next slide. So uh, the history of gender parity, first we'll start with city council. So um, as is stated, the 2021 municipal election will mark 100 years since the first woman was elected to office. And so in 100 years in that time, we've elected just 31 women compared to 238 men um, to the city council. And so 100 years, only one woman has ever served as mayor. Um, and the only time that Edmonton City Council actually ever reached gender parity uh, was back in 1989 when Jan Reimer was our one and only uh, woman mayor. Um, and so there's even further proof that when you elect women, systems change and others are inspired to also run for office. And so we've got a poll up here. Of the 31 women who have served on Edmonton City Council, can you name less than five or five or more? 10 or more, 15 or more, or you cannot name any. And so if you'd like, you can participate. Uh, this is more just to sort of engage the political, um, sort of the political engagement, how much, um, how much people know and can recognize some of, those, um, some of those women who have run for office over the last 100 years. 
and I'm not sure if we will have, oh, there we go. Yeah, so less than five, darn it. <laughs> that's, that's disappointing, but it's also understandable. We don't have, um, we don't have a lot of women, unfortunately we don't have a lot of women city councilors uh, to celebrate. But of those 31, I would encourage you to check them out because they've done phenomenal work that I will cover later in the presentation. Um, why don't we move on to slide four. And so this will be um, talking more about the current landscape um, of city council. So currently only two of 12 city councillors are women. Um, as of the last municipal census, women make up over half, so 52% of the population in Edmonton and yet only account for 15% on our city council. And so the other really interesting thing too is that we see gender parity most often in school boards. So both on the Edmonton Catholic School Board and the Public School Board, we see at least gender parity if not, um, if not more women than men. Um, and so one of the things that we want to focus on as well um, is really encouraging those women who are serving in those um, school board positions to run for city council because we're not seeing those results translate over into city council. And then really quickly, we'll move on. Uh, slide five, we'll talk quickly about the provincial election or the provincial government. So currently, uh, women make up 29% of all sitting MLAs in Alberta, and just two women have ever served as premier. Uh, women being appointed to top positions within government uh, really depends large, largely on the party leader. Um, in the previous election, 160 women ran, only 27 were elected, um, which was about 31% representation. And currently, there are only seven women serving as ministers or associate ministers out of the 23 in total. And then we'll move on to the federal government. So nationally, we've only ever had one woman prime minister. Um, and if you look at the history of first ministers, so those are um, any prime ministers, current premiers or of provinces or territories. Uh, in Canada, only 12 of 300 have ever been women. And so when you look at the the diversity of those women that I've spoke about in um, city council, provincial government, and federal government. Um, it's really the diversity of those women um, who have been elected to the highest, uh, highest levels of office. Numbers are pretty dismal. Um, of the 12 first ministers in Canada, all but two are white, and just one identifies as LGBTQ US plus. Um, and so it's not just important to elect women, it's also important to um, elect a diverse, uh, diverse candidates um, that include gender minorities and women. And so then let's continue on. Um, so the electoral glass ceiling, ceiling, we've all talked about this and heard about this. Um, again, there's progress being made, obviously, um, but it really has stalled at about 25% of all positions. And so really like less than 25% of all the elected officials in Canada self-identify as women with fewer than 15% of the top jobs. So that would be your mayor, premier, uh, party leader and prime minister are held by women. Um, and again, as I was saying, so even more concerning is the lack of diversity among um, Canada's elected officials with only about 7% at last check um, of all politicians in Canada being women of color or indigenous women. And so, uh, when you consider various forms of social and political structures, such as class and race, religion, sexual orientation, age, disability, uh, gender, and other identity markers, this number is even more dismal. So, uh, reasons for gender disparity in politics. We're going to put up another poll, um, and I think we'll get that up soon. Uh, there are numerous reasons for lack of women and gender minorities in office. Um, Everything from political structures being gendered, uh, the electoral process, the position of elected official, historically has all been designed by men for men. And so it wasn't even until 1960 that all women in Canada were granted the right to vote. Um, political issues themselves are gendered. For example, studies show that uh, voters are more likely to associate social issues or soft issues uh, to women and the economy and finances to men, even though both of those issues are completely related and connected. Um, and then barriers for running for office. So on top of all the regular challenges that all candidates face, there are numerous 
barriers specific to women running for office. So everything from disproportionately higher rates of online harassment to a lack of diverse candidate recruitment um, by party leaders and party officials, uh, balancing political and family life in a way that um, male candidates don't necessarily have to, um, and depending on their race, faith, gender identity, physical ability, the barriers are even greater. And then lastly, I'm sorry, I'm just curious to see, 15%, wow, so volunteers, this is great. This means that there are some really engaged people tuning in today, so that's awesome. Um, also, just really quickly, voter bias. So seeing the same type of people getting elected over and over and governing over and over has sort of conditioned us to see politicians in a specific way. Um, and so what most people think of leadership, we sort of have this small little box that we like to check mark and say, okay, they've got this and this and this. Um, and really, I would challenge all of us to start um, looking for those different leadership styles and encouraging those people that you don't often see um, at decision-making tables to run for office because it really is important that we have diverse candidates running with a diverse um, set of leadership skills and experience. Um, that makes for better policy. And then we'll move on to slide nine and talk a little bit um, about the ward boundary changes. So this is new coming into uh, the 2021 municipal election. So just over a year away. Um, Word boundaries, uh, there was a review, and so the word boundaries have changed to make it a bit more equitable. Um, so at present, there are sizable disparities in the sizes of the city's 12 wards, um, both geographically and dem demographically. So some neighborhoods have grown a lot quicker, um, more than others. For instance, uh, like entirely new communities have been brought into Edmonton as a result of annexation. Um, and at the same time, residents in some neighborhoods are raising concerns about being separated from like-minded communities of interest. And so as a result, previous ward boundaries have been revised. Um, and these substantial changes to the shape and size of wards, um, mainly south and uh, south of the North Saskatchewan River. Um, but it was really necessary in order to account for the population shift and expansion in size um, and growth in certain areas. Whereas in the north, it stayed a bit um, it hasn't grown as quickly, and so it looks pretty similar to what the, the map, the ward maps, uh, or ward boundaries, I should say, were before. So something to keep in mind. Um, but it also represents a really good opportunity for counselors that are coming into those new wards, other, like whether you're an incumbent or uh, a newly elected official, you will get the opportunity to represent both new and mature neighborhoods, which is really important. Um, and more pro proportionately balanced in the new ward design. So that's good, good news for all. And then the new wards, this um, is really great news. The new wards will be uh, named based on indigenous land acknowledgement um, and the naming that reflects the history of this area. And so really I wanna give kudos to Terry Sungins who worked with the naming committee to present um, to present their, their, their information and also gain unanimous support from council, which is rare these days. Uh, so that will be moving forward and we should hear back on that, I think at the end of August. Um, so I'm really excited for that. And that I think is a, a good step forward. And then we'll move on to slide 10. You probably heard about the new election rules. Um, so changes to the Local Elections Authority Act were recently announced and so these will be impacting um, the, the 2021 uh, municipal election and so there are some really good changes uh, some of the requirements to transfer any leftover funds you will now be required I think it's anything after two thousand dollars you'll be required to transfer that to a charity instead of holding that um, which sort of levels the playing field for everyone starting out um, but there's also some challenges with uh, with some of the new rules too and so um, many women that are considering running for office, we've heard over and over, have talked about the fact that fundraising is really challenging. And I think fundraising is really challenging for, for all candidates, um, especially now, it's going to be even trickier. Uh, and so having, yeah, having that identified a lack of fundraising knowledge and networks is a real barrier. And so some evidence um, would suggest that people, and specifically women who enter municipal politics, um, 
do so for a, var a variety of reasons, including proximity to uh, their home for childcare and family responsibilities. It's also the level of office that is most closely um, tied to your neighborhood and community, which is the reason why I really love municipal government. Um, but also because for the most part, municipal government has remained uh, largely nonpartisan. And so, um, meaning that candidates don't run with a, pol a political party, you, you run on, um, on your ideas and what you think you can bring to, to the table and to your community and, and how you're gonna represent your constituents best. Um, and so I think that some of these changes will impact whether women decide um, to run or not because uh, expanding some of those fundraising rules, while it is good for candidates that are just starting out, um, it also disproportionately benefits people who have really deep political po pockets and, and political networks. And so um, it gives probably incumbents uh, uh, an advantage. And also, yeah, like I was saying, just people who um, maybe have those deep, deep connections um, to political parties or uh, people with a lot of money. And so I think we can all agree that we want people running based on on what they feel they can bring to the table and not necessarily how much money they can raise. Um, so things to keep in mind. Um, and then also with changes to the third party advertising rules that also um, does impact um, who and um, how you can donate to candidates. So Make sure you read up on those. Uh, we will be doing, um, we'll talk about this later, but as part of some of our uh, training for candidates, we'll be covering this as well. So uh, expect to hear more about this. Um, yeah, so we can carry on. Let me see. All oh, right. Uh, okay, so why don't more women run? Um, Please, there's a whole host of reasons, um, but women more often than not don't self-identify as candidates. Um, they're not elected or they're not um, recruited to run at, at the same rate as men. Um, they don't self-identify and they're not supported to run um, or fund, people don't fundraise as much for women as they do for men, stats show that. So um, I think there's a whole host of reasons why women don't run, but also women tend to want to be really overqualified for the position. And so part of that is, um, you know, making sure that they feel like they can do the, do the job and, and they tend to wait thinking that, you know, I'll learn more or I'll, I'll get more experience and I'll feel more ready when the truth is you're never 100% ready. Um, you only really need to be, what is it, like 60% ready? Um, and so most people have all of the skills that you would need to run. Uh, they just don't necessarily identify those as skills of an elected politician. Um, yeah, let me, right. Oh, and yeah, so women don't necessarily see their skills and experience as leadership qualities when in fact they are. So this mindset paired with other barriers, real barriers like finances and childcare work, um, as well as systemic barriers like sexism and racism all work against getting more people elected. And we'll carry on to slide 12, perfect. Uh, so benefits of gender parity. Uh, when women run, they generally win at the same rate as men. They just don't run at the same rate as men. We've got another poll, right? Oh, this is my, I'm so excited to get this one. So in what year do you think Edmonton city councilors were granted the right to take parental leave? So we've got 1989, 2018, 1996, or 2001. And I'm curious to see what, what people are gonna say to this because I was quite surprised by the answer. Uh, so benefits, as I was saying, um, diverse perspectives and experiences are really distinct from those who have long held political power um, and all too often missing in key policy conversations, everything from education, healthcare, transportation, and urban planning, again, have typically been designed by men for men, and typically for able-bodied, white, cisgendered, upper middle class men. <laughs> So these systems tend to negatively impact and exclude women and gender minorities. Um, studies also show that there's a direct correlation between gender parity and um, population health and wellness. So uh, between 1976 to 2009, women's representation in provincial government across Canada rose 25% nationally. Um, 
At the same time, the total mortality rate from all causes of death declined by 37%. So I like to say that gender parity saved lives. Um, and also, really important, in the six or so years that I've been working at City Hall and watching policy changes come through council, I've seen council change, uh, just to name a few of the things, um, I've seen council change end times for council and committee meetings in order to be more family friendly. Uh, parental leave, as I was saying, for council granted, child care policies and budgets passed by council, um, enhanced accessibility services for those who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, and Edmonton joining the United Nations Women's Safe Cities in Public Spaces for Women and Girls. Uh, again, most of this work was led or initiated by either the current sitting councillors, women counselors um, or the women that are in leadership positions within city administration. So I want to get to this. So what do we think? Oh, everyone's so smart. 2018 is when um, when council finally voted to grant um, parental leave for, for sitting city councilors. And you know, I mean it it surprised me that it actually wasn't in place before that, but it took um, the work of Councillor Esslinger bringing that forward with a bunch of other people that felt that this was really important. And so again, another, um, another reason why electing people um, with diverse backgrounds and experiences is better, it makes better policies. Um, and so gender parity, again, not strictly limited to creating advantages in any way for women. It just ensures that everyone has access um, to the same benefits and opportunities in political office and for the people that elected official serve. So lastly, women in powerful positions serve as powerful role models. So seeing very few people who look like themselves in politics discourages people from um, pursuing an interest in running or getting involved in the first place. And so I, I say this all the time, but yes, it is very important for our young girls and daughters to see women um, holding powerful positions in office. But I'd argue that it's even more important that our young boys and sons see women holding powerful positions in office and normalizing a variety of types of people and leadership styles that, that really are leading um, the next generation and, and how, how our children are going to experience this city when they grow up. So what can we do about it? Uh, run for office. Uh, women generally win, as I was saying, at the same rate um, as men, but they, they don't run. So that's only if they run. Um, we need more women to run in politics and not just the same type of woman. We need all kinds of people with, again, all kinds of experiences and skills and insights to ensure that we're providing the best service for residents. And it might seem overwhelming, but you can do it. And Parity YEG is here to help. Uh, so we've got another poll. Do you plan on, oh yeah, <laughs> this is my, this is sort of my cheeky poll question. Do you plan on supporting a woman candidate in the upcoming election, either by volunteering or donating to their campaign? And the only option you have is yes. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, ask also, ask women to run. So um, really important, women need to be asked to run and stats show that when women are asked and asked often, they will consider running and ultimately usually do. So think in, within your own networks, think of all the, all the people within your networks that you see as leaders or that are um, you know, providing some really good leadership, ask them to run for office and then tell them all the reasons why you think that they should run. Um, <laughs> I love this 95%, yes, it's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry, thank you, Mary Jane, that's so nice of you. Um, sorry, get back on track. Uh, right, so volunteer and donate to their campaigns, as I said. Tell them why you want them to run, um, and then volunteer and donate to their campaigns. Um, and support candidates, other really important things, support candidates that are earning those smaller donation amounts. So both financially and through non-financial means or donations in kind. Um, by volunteering on their campaign, especially with the new election um, fundraising rules, this will we will see people that are able to raise a lot more money, and so we need to make sure, at least for myself, I'm going to make sure that I'm um, supporting those candidates that I know might not have those deep political pockets um, and a huge amount of fundraising dollars. 
Uh, and then also, most importantly, vote. So I'm not suggesting at all that you just vote based solely on gender, um, but I do urge people to vote for candidates that represent feminist issues. Um, if candidates from any gender know that people are casting ballots based on their support for gender equity, that will have a huge impact on moving and advancing women's issues at every level of government. So don't just vote in elections, vote in nomination races, vote for party leadership races, vote in your school councils, your community league board AGM, um, attend policy conventions for the political party of your choice, um, and ask those tough questions of the candidates that are knocking on your door. Ask them what they're going to do to effectively represent um, those not at the decision-making tables and really just get involved. And then slide 14, we're almost done, sorry everyone. Slide 14, so campaign kits. Um, as I was saying, over the next uh, few months leading up to the 2021 municipal election, um, we're going to be offering campaign resource kits for all women that are running for office. And the kits are really just meant to help sort of kickstart um, kick campaigns. We know that women want to be overqualified <laughs> and really prepared. And so we tried to make sure that we covered as many topics as possible um, to really make people feel um, encouraged to run and supported to run. And, and once you sort of go through it, you realize that it's not as hard as you might think. Um, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. So we've had over 20 contributors to our campaign kits so far. Um, everything from past candidates to current elected officials and past elected officials, um, really just some incredibly talented, smart, smart women. Um, who graciously gave their time uh, to support other women who want to kickstart their campaigns. And then also even more exciting for, um, for us at Parity YEG is that we've commissioned the um, City of Edmonton Historian Laureate Amber Fickett uh, to do a um, uh, historical overview of um, women's role in political office in municipal government in Edmonton. Um, and so really talking um, about sort of the history of women's representation, but also um, who wasn't represented, who wasn't um, necessarily granted the right to vote, and, and what were some of those women's organizations at the time, who were they supporting and who weren't they supporting? Um, and I think that that's really important. I'm super excited to learn more about that. And Amber's just fantastic, so uh, we're really excited to have her. Um, Right, and then leading up to uh, the election, we'll have some more campaign um, resort or campaign training, uh, and then uh, networking and mentorship opportunities um, as they'll progress throughout their campaigns. And, and we'll be launching those campaign kits in September. Um, that way we've got the most up-to-date information uh, from Edmonton elections and also from the, the Bill 29, the local elections authority, uh, those rules that I was mentioning before, we'll, um, we'll have the most up-to-date information at that point. And so, yeah, keep an eye out for those. Uh, and then next slide. So cyber misogyny and parody bot. Um, as I was saying, so women are subjected to really an incredibly disproportionate amount of online abuse. And this was something that was identified to um, myself and the board of Parity YEG, and really, you know, I've been doing this work for so, so long. Um, it, it, it's something that I don't even know if it's necessarily just women. I think across the board, people don't like the level of nastiness and, and hatred that can be spewed online. And it is even worse for women, far, far worse. Um, and so we wanted to do something about it because it was something that kept coming up. And so we had talked about it, and um, many of you know Lana Cuthbertson. She's um, brilliant. She was our found. She was a co-founder with with myself and chair of Parity YEG at that time. And um, she had this brilliant idea to um, use artificial intelligence to combat misogyny and online abuse. And so herself and Corey Mathewson, both from Edmonton, um, with the help of the uh, AM Amy, Alberta Machine Institute, Machine Intelligence Institute, I think it is. Sorry, I always just call it Amy. Anyways, they um, helped come up with this uh, bot that uses AI and machine learning to um, detect abusive and misogynistic language directed at women candidates 
and instead then tweet uh, a positive message um, that's been curated from actually people across this country um, who helped us write our positive tweets as we like to call them. And so we deployed the parity bot for the uh, municipal or the provincial and the federal elections in 2019 and they were great um, and we had a ton of interest and uh, and so sort of out of that Lana and I have um, done some more work with that and currently uh, hoping to start on the New Zealand election and the American election so we can tell you more about that when that comes out but Parity Bot will be um, deployed for the municipal election so I encourage everyone to go and follow Parity Bot and reshare it I think it's really important that we highlight the experience that women have online and call it out because it needs to stop. And then finally, um, our goal. So we have a goal to reach 50% uh, of all candidates in the next municipal election will be women. And we are going to work towards that goal. We think that it's important to systemically work towards a number that we can um, hopefully achieve gender parity, but we just want more women to run because we know that when we run, they can win. Um, we just have to encourage them to run. And so, uh, yes, setting a goal of 50%, right. Um, this is what's gonna change <laughs> the gender balance of nominations, candidates, and ultimately elected office. And remember, this isn't about men versus women at all. This is just simply about encouraging all sorts of people to run for office and diversifying the candidate pool from which we elect our officials. So that's just a democracy. Uh, perfect. And then just our last slide. So this is Parity YEG. Connect with us. Uh, unfortunately, really bad timing, but we, um, due to some subscription rules, we had to uh, change our website. We're in the midst of changing it over to a different platform. And so the website, it should be up. Raja on our board is working night and day to get that up. Um, and it should be up any day now. But if you do go to the website, it might not, it might not work right now. It will, I promise. Um, but otherwise, you can get in touch with us anytime on any of our social media handles or by email that's up on the screen there. And we are always open to um, feedback. We know uh, that we can do better and we want to do better. Um, and so we're always open to feedback. And really, just if, if you're just at all considering running and you want to sort of have a coffee very confidentially with someone, um, my door is always open. I'm always happy to chat with candidates and, and just sort of talk it through. Sometimes that's all that's needed um, before you'll put your name forward. So I would encourage everyone to think about running. And if you're not going to run, support a candidate that you feel deserves to be in office and that you think represents your needs the most. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Casey, for that great presentation. That was really some great information. Um, without further ado, and in the interest of time, we'll just dive right in um, into the Q&A session. And just a reminder to all the, to the audience here to enter their questions in the Q&A section, and also to feel free to vote up the question they, uh, they would like to see answered by Casey. So I'll just start. I have a little question for you. Um, it is obvious that yes, we need elected representatives who understand our lived experience. So for far too long, our elected representatives have not looked like some of us, nor have they lived our you know, experience, which means women and people of color are often left behind when crucial decisions are made, right? So the intersectionality of being a black immigrant woman has always made elections time a very interesting time for me. Here I am, I want to exercise my right to vote, but none of the people who are running for office represent my gender, and fewer still represent my ethnicity or my status as an immigrant. It's, it is hard to vote for someone who doesn't understand your lived experience. In the 12 years that I've lived in Edmonton, I've only ever seen two individuals who represent my lived experience as a person of color, an immigrant, and as a woman. One was my mother, Beatrice Getuba. She ran for member of parliament position in the 2015 federal elections. And then again in 2017 for a municipal council seat in Edmonton. The other woman is Habiba Mohammed, who ran for a member of parliament office in the last elections. And both these women lost. And I think now that perhaps support from an organization like uh, Parity YEG may have been what tipped the skills for my mother if it existed then back in 2015. 
So my question to you is actually two questions sort of uh, together is, what is the singular most important obstacle that immigrant women face that prevent them from running for office and if they run from being successful? And what work is Parity YEG doing on the ground in Edmonton to encourage and support immigrant women who are running for office or who want to run for office? Mm -hmm. uh, great questions. I don't have all the answers, unfortunately. Um, I do know with some of our work um, with some past candidates, that definitely has come up. Uh, when our website is up and running, um, Giselle General wrote uh, a really incredible piece about um, sort of her view of the political process um, coming from somewhere outside of Canada, coming here and seeing how it is here and, and just how she's learned to sort of navigate that. And it really, it, it does I, I actually, I don't even have a good enough answer. I'm sorry. I, I just, I don't. We, we know that we have more work to do. Um, part of what uh, Hebo and I actually were chatting about last yesterday, uh, when the campaign resource kits come out in September, we have a very um, prioritized list of who we're going to reach out to to ensure that we're. Um, providing those resource kits to some of those groups that are doing a lot of this work already within their own communities mm -hmm. um, and so maybe that could help some people who might be on the fence running um, but having said that we also know that we we can't possibly um, speak for everyone so you know part part of what we're going to be doing too in September is really making sure that we're um, having people from a wide variety of experiences and and an insight coming to provide some of those learning opportunities for all of us um, to, to help Parity YEG do better at what we do, um, but also just to um, sort of raise awareness about the about the barriers that that women face when they aren't necessarily you know someone who's lived here or has political experience. I mean, partly why I'm so. Um, involved in politics is that my parents were and my family was and so it, it's a bit easier to to get into politics when you have some role models um, and yeah I mean your mom Beatrice that was she came and and like I I really I, I hope that she considers Ryan again because she's <laughs> um, so Please tell her that we will be reaching out to her. <laughs> yes. Well, we everybody tells her that, but she's very uh, adamant that it's time for the younger ones to take over. So Aww. she's happy to support uh, whoever wants to run for office from the immigrant community. But thank yeah. you so much for answering that. I'll just go into the Q&A now. Um, the question that we have that's been upvoted the most right now is, I hear your comment about the attraction of municipal politics not being associated with party politics. Mm -hmm. In the 2021 election, although there will not be formal association, the likelihood, the likelihood of a government of Alberta referendum will politicize the election. That is undoubtedly going to change the tone of the election. How will Parity YG approach the heightened political activity? Yeah. Um... Yeah, it, it's really tough. As I was saying, we, everyone on our board, honestly, we come from all political backgrounds and, and we really do, we think it's important that we all work together. Gender, uh, gender equity is not exclusive to one party or another, um, but it is, it is tough sometimes when we all are politically active and engaged. Um, some, of these, some of these changes are going to have major impacts. On, on candidates running. And we really probably, unfortunately, will see, um, you know, government's party, party partisanship in municipal office, which is unfortunate in my opinion. Um, Parity YG, obviously we want to remain um, multi-partisan is what we're called. And, and obviously when you register with the Societies Act, um, as a nonprofit, there's certain rules that you have to follow as well. So bearing all of that in mind, um, we're really just going to take the stand that it, 
it doesn't matter what party you're from. Uh, having a level of decorum and um, treating people with respect and debating ideas instead of each other is the best way forward. We think that's not just um, the best thing for women who are considering running. I think people in general would like to see the decorum of political office um, raised. And, and it is a deterrent. People see some of what goes on and think, why would I, why would I get involved in that? Um, the problem is that it's not gonna change until we get fresh faces and people with new ideas and new ways of doing things in office. Thank you. Our next question is, how do candidates in particular uh, in municipal elections where there's no party association communicate their platform and the values they stand for and attract voters that way? Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, there's a couple things you can do. I would, whenever someone approaches me and says, you know, I'm considering running, what should I do next? Uh, I sort of have this like long email um, <laughs> that goes through a bunch of things. But one of the things is really just getting involved in your community in, in any way. So as I said, you know, getting involved in your community league, um, that gives you a lot of perspective um, into what sort of things your neighbors and, and people that are living in your area, what sort of concerns they have. Um, there's, you know, getting board experience is important. You can get involved in school councils. Um, there's all kinds of things you can get involved in. But as far as forming your platform, I think one of the most important things to do is to listen, is to just listen to the people who um, live in your neighborhood and, and the people that you're, you know, working with. What are, what, are they, what are they complaining about? What are the things that are concerning to them? That's really, I mean, there's so many skills it takes, yes, to be to be a politician, but I think one of the most important things is the ability to listen because that really is your job. So I think to form a good platform, yes, you know, ideally you would have a bunch of those ideas formed, um, but that's not necessarily something that's required. If you don't have, you know, your list of say five things that you would want to do if you were elected to office, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't run. Um, Part of door knocking and engaging with residents is learning what sorts of things you you would be focused on um, if you were to win. And so I would say really just start listening right now. Your, your platform will evolve as you learn more about your ward and about the constituents that call your ward home. Absolutely. I know that's one thing my mother always said about um, when she was campaigning and doing a lot of door knocking that that uh, listening to people that she was engaging with was so important and she felt that she really connected with uh, with uh, her con the constituents, the people because they, she, she almost felt like I wish when the, after the election she wanted to go back and check in on them and say you know but obviously that was not possible but yes listening is is really key, I, I believe. So I'll go to the next question, which is, um, what are some non-traditional ways to engage the community in knowing about you, your platform, and your want to, and how you want to make things better by running as a city councillor? Specifically, with a pandemic in place and the ongoing revolution regarding social issues, some people may fear opening the door to chat, attending a public event, or even engaging with others. Are your resource kits equipped with possible virtual solutions or uh, social engagement platforms? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we talk a lot about that in our campaign resource kits. So um, that that specifically will be covered. It is. I mean, it's a it's a tricky. Even for us, I mean, Hebo could probably talk about this as well we sort of had this whole plan of what we were going to be doing Parity YG and then COVID hit and everything changed. And so we had to sort of quickly move to an online platform. Um, but as, so we'll be releasing the campaign kits in September. And then as we lead up to the election for that year, uh, we're going to be doing different um, training sessions based on some of the topics. And obviously that one will be probably the first one how to engage with residents during this time because yeah it, it is it's tricky i i know some politicians um and candidates are already doing some door knocking so i i think you know if you take the right precautions and and are really respectful i, th I think you can do that in a in a positive way um 
But also, as I was saying earlier, I think now more than ever, it's more important to really get involved. So community leaders are still having virtual meetings and AGMs. Um, certainly there's some, I think there's still some positions open on certain boards and commissions through the city of Edmonton uh, that you can get involved in. Uh, and then, I mean, really, yeah, now more so than ever, online engagement is, is going to be critical. And so, you know, if there's, if there's things that I would suggest doing right now to get yourself ready is like, yeah, beef up your, your social media profiles. Um, make sure that you're joining groups um, and, and like community leagues. I, I keep talking about community leagues, but I sort of come from that background. I volunteered on my community league for a long time and that sort of led me into um, municipal politics. And so it really, like you learn, you learn all kinds of really um, important things about your community, but it's also a really great way to network. And so that's another, I, I would suggest getting involved in your community leagues, even on Facebook, follow all of your, all of the community leagues that are within your ward, follow them on social media so that you can keep up to date on some of the events that they're doing that you can join in on. Um, and also some of the events that they're collaborating with around, around the city within your ward. Um, I would say start there and then really at this point start talking to your family and friends tell them that you're thinking about running ask them to host a virtual or you know this socially distanced safe coffee party for you um, start I always say as part of as part of sort of my speech too, write down um, sort of your three levels of of circles I say so you're really close family and friends the ones that you're going to um, say, I'm going to run for office and I need your help and please donate to me. <laughs> and then you're going to have sort of your more professional network. So write down all of the names and you, by the end you'll have a list of um, people that you can start reaching out to. And I think that's a really good way of doing that, especially in municipal politics. Um, it really is the people that it, it's your neighbors. You're, you're really running to represent your neighbors and your community and, you know, the parents that your kids go to school with. Um, and so start thinking about all the different ways that you can let people know that you're considering running or that you are running um, and to talk about why you're running. I think it's really important. Serena Ma did um, a submission for our campaign resource kits. And one of the things that really struck me is she said, tell your story. It's not about, you know, I have a list of all these accomplishments or I've done all this, but really just authentically telling why you're running, why you think you're the best person, and, and really just start telling anyone that will listen, <laughs> or tell me and I'll tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. I think we have time for just one more question, so I'll just uh, read this one really quickly, and I think we'll have a couple of minutes. Um, there are already rumors of politicized slates being prepared with all candidates being supported by a political party. How does this affect fundraising? Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, so, so as I was saying, the, the changes to the third party advertising rules, um, some, of the, some of the wording has sort of left it open for interpretation um, and sort of opens the door, could open the door for political candidates to, as you were saying, run slates. Um, there's rumors, there's all kinds of rumors. I, you know what? I don't know. Don't listen to all the rumors. If you want to run, run. It, like, I think if political parties are running slates, yes, that's absolutely. I, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat it. It's going to impact how much money candidates can raise. But I've also seen candidates with not a lot of money win, you know, handedly against candidates who, who do have a lot of money. So, are you going to be at a disadvantage if, if you might not have that? And if you do have that support, I'm not saying that's a bad thing either. That's great too. But, but don't let it deter you if you don't necessarily have that support. Yes, that's going to happen. I, I have no doubt that that's already happening. Um, but I don't think it should deter anyone from running for office. Really, if you think that what you have is what it takes to represent the people that you are you know, sharing your community with, then you should run. That's that's it, whether you think you're gonna have big money support or not. And also the other thing, um, Janice Aaron wrote a really beautiful blog about um, 
like momentum builds. So when you announce, you sort of announce and there's this big hype that like, oh my gosh, I'm an I've announced, I'm running, this is crazy. And then it sort of gets a little bit slower and you think, oh, you know, should I be doing all these things that other people are doing? And it seems like everyone else is doing so much more and better than me. And I think everyone feels that way um, at a certain point and also momentum builds. So if you don't have that team right away, it grows, it grows. And your fundraising dollar grows as the, as the election draws near um, and as like the general public start learning more about the election. Because let's face it, most people right now are not thinking about the 2021 municipal election. They're thinking about, you know, more important things, day to day things, um, but they will start thinking about it soon enough. And, and so, yeah, I, I would just say really, I think you should just say you're going to do it and, um, and start doing some of those things, start thinking like a politician. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, talk to as many people as you can um, and just garner as much support okay. as you can. I think that just leads into this very simple, very short question then of um, kind of connected to what you just said, which mm -hmm. is how long before the election should someone finalize their decision to run and start fundraising or campaigning? Sure. Um, okay, so that, okay, I don't know if I can answer that quickly. Um, I don't think it's ever too late. I've seen candidates decide way, way earlier. And I've seen candidates decide almost last minute. And I, I think, I think it can work either way. Um, I would say you should be starting to obviously come around to that decision. Certainly a year out, you would want to um, start having some of those conversations with your friends and family. Um, but with the changes to the uh, election potential proposed changes to the election rules, um, I can't give you a hard answer, except that if all the proposed changes go through, you will be allowed to start fundraising. You can fundraise um, certain amounts between election years and then nomination period from my understanding is the same. So that is January 1st of the election year, which will be 2021. And so at that point, I would say, you know, we'll start to see more people announcing their intention to run and fundraising and that kind of stuff. But I don't think it's ever I mean, too late except for the cutoff period, which is the the like exactly four weeks from the election. Okay, great. We have so many questions, great questions, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. So thank you so much, Casey, for that thank great you, presentation. Bye. Yes, I'll just pass over to uh, Hebo uh, to just kind of finish up to wrap it up. And yes, thank you so much again. So over to you, Hebo. Um, hi everyone. Um, I can see there's some questions left. So if you guys would like to connect with Pair Two YEG, you could email us, um, and would be happy to uh, would be happy to answer those questions. Um, so yeah. And um, in my closing remarks, I'd like to thank uh, Casey. I would also uh, uh, like to thank Casey on behalf of the YWCA Edmonton staff and board of directors. Um, for participating in the Powerland Speaker Series and all her work, um, and and all of her work uh, at Parity YEG. Um, lastly, thanks to all of you who have participated as well. Um, the YWCA Speaker Series uh, appreciates your support. Um, um, please stay in touch. Um, help them continue our mission of building a stronger, safer, and more equal community for everyone. Um, head to their website and social media channels for more information on how to get involved or to donate. And stay tuned um, uh, for the coming months for, fu uh, uh, for future Power Lunch uh, series. And also thank you to our moderators, um, Lisa Holmes and Sandra Mochiska. Uh, until then, uh, have a great afternoon and goodbye.